welcome to our latest Best for Britain live. Thank you all very much for joining us today on this Friday afternoon on a week where the government, of course, has brought forward its Northern Ireland protocol bill and when the threat of triggering Article 16 is never very far from its lips. So who better to have with me on the sofa at Best for Britain today than Anglophile, Europhile, of course, it's Terry Reinke, MEP. Terry, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. We, I'm happy to be we here. We are delighted to have you here. Um, I think that despite Brexit, it isn't unfair to characterize you as an Anglophile. Absolutely. What is it about Britain that you love? A lot of things. And, you know, being back here after quite a long time because, well, obviously because of COVID, um, I couldn't come personally um, in many years. I think the last time I was here was in 2019. Um, I'm... I'm again, you know, I've, I've, I feel I've fallen in love again because there are so many things that I love here. Um, first of all, the language, obviously, but I also really like the mentality. I still have the feeling that there is so much, you know, openness in the country. And, you know, I know a lot of things seem very grim right now, but uh, I will go back tomorrow with a lot of positive feeling and enthusiasm about no. continuing to work together. So you've been all over the country this week. Where have you been? Who have you spoken to? What have been the highlights? of your week so far? I've had a lot of highlights. Um, so we started in Edinburgh where um, we met uh, some uh, MSPs, so members of the Scottish Parliament. We met some people from the government. Um, we met um, to discuss about, obviously, the cooperation between Scotland uh, and the European Union. Um, but also for me, it was a little bit coming back home because I studied in Edinburgh for a year. I did my wow. Erasmus year there. So it was very oh, nice. Oh, Erasmus. Yes. Erasmus. Yes. My father was, um, I think, the third ever president of Erasmus because he was an academic. He was the vice chancellor um, and was a, such a fierce advocate of Erasmus. And it feels like such an unnecessary thing to do to come out of Erasmus because you don't have to be a member of the European Union exactly. to participate, that's right? Exactly. You, I mean, the, the UK could have very easily stayed a member um, and um, well, part of the part of the program um, without being a member of the European Union. Um, and I really think it's one of the most unnecessary bits of Brexit. I mean, not that I like Brexit as a whole, sure. but I think really leaving the Erasmus Plus program is such a loss not only for people in the UK, but for people from all over Europe, because I think this experience to come here and to study in Edinburgh for this year, I mean, academically, it was very a very good experience for me, but also personally, you know, I, I very often say that I think it really made me a truly European person. And I'm actually quite sure that I wouldn't be a member of the European Parliament today if it wasn't for that time, wow. because my English improved. I got to know so many people, not only from the UK, but from all over Europe, from all over the world. Um, and I think it really broadened my horizon. So I really hope that um, we can get the UK back into the Erasmus Plus program. Me too. So you've been in Edinburgh. Yes. But you've been everywhere, haven't you? You've been yes. Up, length and breadth of the country. Where else? We, we learned that there is a very limited amount of high speed trains in the UK, apparently. <laughs> yes. So we, we, we went from Edinburgh to uh, Bristol. I think it took us six hours or something Ryan, like that. Like Birmingham or something? Yes. Or even, yes. Okay. We stopped in a lot of places, okay. which is, you know, it's good to get to know the country a little bit better. So we, we, we get to know a lot of stations. Um, and then we went to Bristol and we met some local councillors there. Um, also, we. Um, but well, the Greens do very well in Bristol. Exactly. So uh, we also wanted to see how the city is developing because I'm also very interested in things, for example, like public transport. Um, you've probably, maybe you've heard about the fact that we have something very new and shiny in Germany where we have a nine euro public transport ticket um, for the whole we country. absolutely do not have that. Not only do we not have enough high speed rail whatsoever, the rail that we do have is eye-wateringly expensive, Yes. Really, very, very. So I think this yeah. is something that maybe also in cooperation we can continue to work on, um, because I think it's very important. Well, when we talk about climate change, you know, obviously we talk about energy production and we talk about agriculture, but I think we also really have to talk about transport, because I'm very passionate about people being able to move around. But I think it's just it has to be in a climate friendly. Or we should give people the possibility to do that in a climate friendly way. Um, that is affordable. 
that is affordable, that is accessible. It is cheaper to get on a plane to Spain than it is to get on a train from Birmingham to Edinburgh, for instance. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And then, you know, we have to make it safe. We have to make it accessible for people. So this is something that I'm also very passionate about. And then to see a little bit how also in Bristol this is developing also with regards to uh, bike biking and possibilities to use the bike. Um, so that was very interesting. You've got to have very strong legs to cycle in Bristol. A lot of very steep hills in Bristol. <laughs> London, perfect, very flat, lovely. Yeah, yeah. I cycle in London. I, I do not have the strength to cycle in Bristol. You know, I happen to come from a very flat region in Germany as well, where it's, which is close to the Netherlands. Yeah. Um, so cycling is something that, you know, to me was always very practical to go around. But it's true. Um, you need to have a good bike um, yeah. if you if you have to climb up some hills. And, uh, and then after Bristol, uh, we went to Oxford just for a quick stop where we had an event with Oxford for Europe um, to talk about Brexit, obviously, but also other issues. Um, we talked about um, the situation of refugees and what is happening in Ukraine, how this affects Europe. Um, why this actually makes it even more important to cooperate closely between the UK and the European Union. And um, so that was very interesting. And then I came to London. Yay! <laughs> and you're wearing your pride colours today. Of course, it's Pride Weekend here in London. This exactly. Weekend. And I've already been to the uh, Gay Liberation March, oh, wow. where there were some of the veterans, because, you know, it's the 50th yeah. anniversary of Pride in London, which I think... You know, thinking about how the situation was 50 years ago and how much progress we have already made. I mean, I'm really not saying that we have gone all the way. We are yeah. still far away from full equality. But I think it was very emotional for me to see, you know, really seniors who said, you know, we were here 50 years ago and we are still fighting for LGBTI equality. So that was a very nice experience. Well, you touched on some of this Um but here at Best of Britain, we are all about restoring and deepening the relationship between the UK and the EU. But our current government seems determined to do the opposite at the moment, unfortunately. How is Britain perceived in Brussels and across the EU27 more broadly at the moment? What would you say, I mean, obviously you are an Anglophile, but but but... Britain and maybe you have to separate Britain from its government mm -hmm. but, but what is the sort of current perception across Europe of us? Mm -hmm. I think that's the first thing that I would say. I think there is a very different perception of the current UK government and especially the Prime Minister and the people in the UK because I think that um, with regards to the government obviously I think there is also just a lot of frustration because people feel that certain, I mean when I talk to people in Germany but also in other European and EU countries and um, people feel that there's so many problems that we have right now that actually we should be talking about like you know cooperation on energy and foreign and security on a lot of issues that are maybe also not addressed even in the trade and cooperation agreement to the degree that we would have liked it to but other than you know addressing that what we are doing right now is to talk about the northern Ireland protocol but not in a way of actually trying to find solutions to the problems that are there on the ground because we are very ready to do that the commission proposed a package that would really uh, decrease the paperwork and um, that would make it much easier especially for for smaller companies um but instead of looking at that, now we have this whole procedure with a bill that has been introduced and we, well, or a lot of people perceive it as something that is actually not to help the situation in Northern Ireland, but it's a very um, sort of domestic issue, especially in the Tory party. Um, and th that I think is perceived very negatively because we should actually be solving other issues. But having said that, um, I still think, and I was very surprised about the question that a lot of people were asking me here, like, okay, um, if now there would be a turnaround and we would like to rejoin at some point, um, would the EU even be thinking about yeah. taking us back, you know, something like this. And I think there is still such a positive feeling and so much love, you know, and really will for cooperation amongst EU citizens to mm. um, to the people in the UK. So for me, that was never really the question. For me, there is still an open door. It is just going to be the question how the political discussion in the UK is going to, to develop. And what I'm trying to do is to say, look, we are in this situation right now. Let's try to make 
everything possible that we can in terms of cooperation, be it trying to get the UK back into Erasmus, but also be it, you know, different channels that we have that we can use, because I think that that has actually become even more important over the past months. Now, you were in Edinburgh, and of course, this week, Nicola Sturgeon announced her desire for a second referendum on independence for Scotland. And a lot of people who perhaps previously had voted no and wanted to say part of the UK, but who very strongly identified with Europe and Mm -hmm. Remain, Mm -hmm. now potentially see independence to Scotland as their only route to having their EU citizenship restored. Was this something that was talked about when you were in Scotland? Did, Did people raise the prospect of an independent Scotland being able to join the EU? Mm -hmm. Um, We discussed about that. I mean, I've never taken a position about Scottish independence. And I also think that's then really something for the people in Scotland to decide um, what they're willing to do. Um, uh, For me, I mean, one of the things that I think I I can be and should be said um, is that obviously the situation compared to 2014 has massively changed because being inside or outside of the European Union does make a difference. Um, And I think that... um, I mean, what is true for the whole of the UK would also be true for Scotland. Uh, If Scotland was to decide to become an independent country, you know, on a legal pathway, um, then I think because Scotland had previously applied, like the UK, um, the full acquis of the European Union, um, it would be much easier uh, to rejoin. I also think that this is true um, when you, for example, compare it to countries like, you know, Ukraine and Moldova Moldova. just got Mm -hmm. candidate status and Georgia has a pathway towards it. And also we have countries in the Western Balkans where hopefully we can start with the accession uh, negotiations soon. Um, And I'm very much into, you know, trying to make this as fast and as efficient as possible. But a country that has never applied EU legislation as a whole obviously has more barriers to overcome than a country that had previously applied all of the EU legislation. Um, So I would say there is an open door, both for Scotland as an independent country, but also for the UK as a whole, obviously. Well, that is lovely to hear. And it is, oh, you're right, it's something that comes up all the time. People say, well, after everything we've put them through, (laughs) the the prospect of of us uh, rejoining um, and then potentially having another election that would bring a government back that would also have a leave agenda and it would just be this sort of constant yo-yo just might not um, uh, be very attractive to Brussels, which I'm sure we we could all understand. Um, But can I maybe add there, I think one of the things that probably people would like to see is that there is an in-depth conversation in the society and then a really clear political majority that, you know, now we have tried this. It very obviously, I mean, to me, if you look at the numbers, even in the UK, people don't think that Brexit is working, no? Yeah. Um, so then to have this conversation and then to say, now we really decide to, you know, turn this around and, and come back. Um, and maybe not with then a 72% majority, but really with a, with a big, you know, political push for it. Mm. Um, I think that would be something that could be very helpful. I think for that probably some debates inside of the society here will be needed. I think that's also what you are obviously trying to to push for. I think a lot of people from the pro-European citizens movement are trying to push for that. I think that's very, very useful. And I think it's even something that can give inspiration to a lot of EU countries. Well, I was going to ask, has Brexit um, and almost certainly Putin's invasion of Ukraine strengthen the European project? You know, ironically, I think for Brexit, you can even look at the numbers and see clearly that it's true. And, you know, the longer that now, um, you know, Brexit is ongoing and all the difficulties that come with it and now, you know, the economic disadvantages that it brings uh, and so on, I think people see what what advantages it has to be member of the European Union, which maybe some people beforehand in Germany for sure were a little bit taken for granted, you know, like EU citizenship, freedom of movement, you know, it's just something that you have. And now suddenly they see that people in the UK have lost that. Um, And also 
economically, politically with the Erasmus Plus program. And um, so I think that, yes, it has actually, um, and I mean, you can look at Eurobarometer, um, um, really increased the numbers yeah. of people supporting membership. Um, but for me, what is very important, not to, you know, now sit back and say, yeah, we are doing well, but to also address the challenges that we have in the European Union, mm. because I'm not saying everything is fine in the European Union. There are a lot of things that we need to reform. There are a lot of issues that are not going well. Um, I mean, now you mentioned the, the aggressive attack on Ukraine. We can see that, for example, when we were coming up with the sanctions packages um, towards Russia, because we still have unanimity in council to take foreign and security uh, policy decisions, we very often had a situation where people like Viktor Orban can actually take the rest of the European Union hostage in a way, you know, because they can say, we are not going to agree unless you give us this or that. And this is something that we certainly have to work on. And we really have to think about how we can reform the European Union to make it fit for the next 50, 100, whatever years. Yeah, sure. When people you know, were challenging me during the, the referendum and saying, oh, but you can't possibly say that Europe doesn't need to be reformed. I said, I've never said that. Yes. But yes. I also want to reform the House of Commons and the House of Lords. Mm. I don't think any democracy is ever perfect. Yes. You have to be ever, yes. ever vigilant and, and keeping it fit for uh, modern times. Um Let's talk about Germany specifically now, if you don't mind. Germany has been incredibly generous uh, to those seeking asylum in recent years, taking far more refugees than many other countries. How has this approach been of benefit to Germany, you know, socially, economically? What lesson could other countries learn from the way Germany has approached its generosity to those fleeing war, violence, etc.? Mm-hmm. I mean, you're right, but I would still maybe put it into perspective because also in Germany we have had very, very difficult, com uh, very difficult campaigns and debates uh, on the right to asylum over the past years, and also certain things have been more restricted than they used to be. Um, I think there has been like a far right campaign against the right to asylum, asylum seekers specifically. So we have all of these problems also in Germany. Um, but I think, and that's true, um, there is still maybe more of a societal openness and I think also the importance of the right to asylum. Um, and this is really also across political parties. So it's not only something that, for example, the Green Party would defend, but it's um, it's in, in a lot of political parties really ingrained. Um, that is something that plays uh, a big role. I think on the one hand, um, it gives us a very strong um, responsibility to push for having reforms in terms of asylum and migration inside of the European Union, because a lot of these issues are actually not only decided on the national level anymore. Um, obviously, you know, countries can take refugees uh, to, to a different degrees, but what we always wanted was a functioning European asylum system. And what we see right now is that that's not the case. It's one of the things that I actually think the European Union really has the need to reform. Um, like the Dublin system that you can only apply for asylum in the first EU country that you have um, that you have entered. Um, also the relocation system that we have, it's not functioning. Um, so it's really something where we need to see progress. Uh, and as you know, certain member states have previously been blocking that, like for example, Poland, Hungary. Yeah. But I think now with the situation of refugees from Ukraine coming and the activation of the temporary pro uh, sorry, protection directive, um, maybe there is going to be a possibility to open these uh, debates again and to have a little bit of different dynamic where we see, look, at the end of the day, we all share the basis on fundamental rights, on democracy and parts of, you know, human rights is the right to seek asylum. Shouldn't we have a functioning system for that? I know maybe I'm a little bit too optimistic, but I still hope that we can find a way to reform the current system uh, and then to, you know, defend the right to asylum and create a safe haven for everybody who is seeking refuge in Europe. And I'm just very sorry that Britain isn't part of leading that conversation and advocating for uh, refugees. It, it sounds like it will be a very... Um, interesting, powerful and necessary conversation happening in Europe. We're going to do a quick fire now mm -hmm. and lighten, lighten the tone a little bit. Okay. In a game that I'm going to call World Leader Word Association. 
So I'm going to read out a name. Oh, no, this is going to be bad. And you're going to say the first word that comes into your head okay. today. Okay. Are you ready? Okay. Okay. Yes. Olaf Schultz. Ooh, Verwaltungsbeamter. I know that this is German, so um, a very um, administ like very administrative uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. politician. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good with the detail, or yeah, yeah, good yeah, manager. yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. In, in more of a manager sometimes than you know somebody who is very political in some Okay, uh, okay. Second one, Ursula von der Leyen. Mm, that's a tough one. Um, I would say a maker. She definitely is a maker. Yeah. Okay, uh, Jacinda Ardern. She's an inspiration. Oh, that's a good word. <laughs> she won't mind that one, will she? No. Uh, Joe Biden. Um, can I not say a word but a phrase? Sure. Is it a German phrase? No. Oh. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, maybe pop it up a little bit. Okay, yeah. Come on, Joe. Yeah, yeah, yeah come on, Joe. Uh, Emmanuel Macron. Ooh, a big disappointment for me. Okay, mm. okay. Uh, Boris Johnson. <laughs> okay, I knew you were going to say Boris Johnson, <laughs> and now how do I put this diplomatically? Um, I would say um, a prime minister to a country that I love very much, uh, and in that not what I would expect a prime minister of that country to be. Thank you for being much more diplomatic and polite than I would have been if I'd been <laughs> answering that question. And finally, Greta Thunberg. Ah, uh, Greta, she's a, she's a powerhouse. She, yeah. is, she has gotten something going that I didn't think could happen and she has kept it going and she really is an energetic young woman. She is. So let's go on to climate change. Mm -hmm. um, G7 leaders met in Germany this week um, and they granted exceptions to previous climate goals. So as a Green MEP, how do you react to that? I think it's very disappointing to see that, you know, we had the Paris Agreement and even with the Paris Agreement, we know that there is going to be like, the reality that we are going to face is going to be devastating. Like we already see the things that are happening now. You know, we see the, the forest fires, we see the droughts, we see the extreme weather event, events that are happening outside now. Um, and I think when Paris happened, I was there and we really thought this is a turning point. And from here, you know, this is now international law that we'll have to follow. We, the world leaders agreed on this mm -hmm. and we will become more ambitious. You know, this is a starting point, but we can really turn this around. And then now I have the feeling that we are still struggling every step of the way to remind people that, you know, Paris is not just something that, you know, some climate activist one, but it is actually something that has been agreed on. And that is something that I experience as very frustrating. And especially then when we make um, legislation, even on the European level, that we know is not going to go far enough even to meet the climate mm. goals, you mm. know. So mm. this to me is really something that again and again frustrates me massively. And I think it's also a reminder that just, you know, keep and I'm, I am a politician, I'm a parliamentarian, but, you know, just leaving it to the politicians and the parliamentarians is not going to be enough. We have to keep up the pressure from the streets. We need to have people protesting for this, continuing their protest, um, because only then we can have enough, you know, pressure. We can have enough um, uh, dynamic in parliaments to actually adopt the legislation that we will need to meet the Paris goals mm. and, potentially even go, go beyond. beyond. So what would you want G7 countries to achieve by 2030? You said that even some of the Paris commitments didn't go far enough. What would far enough look like for you? Well, I think that right now, I mean, as you know, in the EU, we have the Fit for 55 package, um, which is, well, in itself, let, let's start with the positives. It is a, a package. I mean, we have the reduction uh, of 55%, of which was 
not what we wanted. It's not enough. We said it's even not enough to meet the, the Paris goals, but it is. And that is something I think we can um, we can also for the moment then at least celebrate the biggest climate deal, legislative deal that we have ever had. So it is a first step. Um, but in order to meet the Paris goals, in order to, you know, really make, keep this world as a livable planet, um, we'll have to go beyond that. And it's not going to be easy for anyone, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not expecting, um, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm not trying to lie to people and tell them this is just going to be a walk in the park. It is not. But I think um, at the end of the day, um, for everybody in our societies, you know, and also for future generations, this is the only option that we have right now. Um, so I think we need more ambition. Um, we need more readiness also to find new ways of, of dealing and reacting and improvising. I think we have also seen this now with the, with the situation with Russia. I mean, Germany, a country that is very heavily dependent on Russian gas, I mean, then you very ad hoc need to find other possibilities mm -hmm. to handle this now. Uh, and that will come up. And, and that gets us into the, the broader definition of sustainability beyond just the, the, the climate aspect of it. Cost of living emergency mm -hmm. happening here in mm -hmm. the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, this week, inflation um, has hit 9.1%, the highest for 40 years predictions that it will be even higher. You've mentioned, obviously, Germany's uh, energy dependence on Russia. What is uh, the cost of living situation in Germany at the moment? Is it is it as bad as here? Is it slightly less bad? I think, I think it is a little bit less bad because I think, um, obviously, also the negative effects of Brexit are kicking in here. Um, I also believe that inflation is higher in the UK um, than it is uh, in Germany currently. Um, but I mean, the situation is also not good and yeah. potentially getting worse. Um, and in so food Germany. security is, is the big thing. It was also talked about at the G7 this week. Um, at Best of Britain, uh, we run the UK Trade and Business Commission. We had a session yesterday on food inflation and trying to disentangle the effects of Brexit on food prices from other impacts. Mm -hmm. But food security also comes under the issue of climate change and 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 sustainability more broadly. Um, what impact is is Germany seeing as a consequence of the food supply issues from Ukraine? Is that something that is having almost as big an impact as the energy costs on inflation there, or is it not such a big concern because you're still within that single market and you can more easily access food from other places? I guess it. It's uh, again, like the situation is not good, um, but it's probably not as bad as it is here. Um, but also in Germany, I mean, there have been debates about how do we address this now? Um, and there have already been uh, a number of um, packages adopted, um, monetary support for especially people um, who are uh, in economic hardship. Um, but I think none of these actually really meets the, the need. And I think that um, we will have to find ways to, to do even more, um, especially for, for families. Um, I think there is a very big challenge there. Um, and also... But do we just have to fundamentally change our approach to food and food supply? And do we now have to, as wealthy Northern Europeans, say, actually, maybe we shouldn't be eating avocados out of season and flying berries 10,000 kilometers across the sea during winter and you know from, from the green perspective do we need to have a different approach to how we consume? I mean what we have been trying to do already for many years now and it hasn't been all successful is to sh uh, shift the common agricultural policies in the European Union um, and I think that this is something that we really need to push for and it's probably you know it's not an ad hoc that would change the situation right now because in order to um, shift the supply chains you need some time but to have more regional more seasonal um, uh, agricultural system to have more sustainable agricultural system to have smaller farming and I mean, we could actually 
shift that because with the common agricultural policy, we have a lot of tools in our hand to, for example, gear money towards not only this, the square meter or the hectare that you have, um, but to say if you meet cer certain ecological or social um, criteria, then you are going to get more money, otherwise not. Um, but unfortunately, this has been a very big green demand, but um, we didn't really find the majorities uh, inside neither of the parliament um, nor um, uh, then in the decision making on the European level. But I think it's very urgently needed because I think now in this crisis situation, it is an issue. But in the long run, the agricultural shift, so to have more sustainable agriculture, to have better food, to have um, obviously um, a, bit, a bigger variety of different crops uh, being grown, um, all of these questions are very deeply entangled uh, with not only climate change, but also the second ecological crisis, with it, which is biodiversity. Um, and this is why we have to push for it in the interest of the planet, in the interest of the environment, but also in the interest of people. Because I think uh, eating good food, having access to good food um, is also something that we need to fight for. Well, I am very glad that we have people like you in the European Parliament speaking sense about these things. We're nearly at the end of the show. So it's Friday afternoon. People are watching, but they're thinking about starting their weekend. Tell us what the perfect weekend in Britain looks like for you. <laughs> Maybe you want to just locate it in Edinburgh because that's, you know, the city that you know best. Maybe you want to pretend you can time travel across the country without any high speed rail needs. <sighs> Talk us through what your perfect weekend in Britain would look like. Uh, you know what? When I was in Edinburgh, I ran up Arthur's seat, uh -huh. uh, you know, the little hill. Yeah. Um, and I think I would definitely go hiking yeah. because I really love hiking and I really love the landscape. And not only in Scotland, but um, uh, also in a lot of other places in the UK. So I'd do that. Um, and I would definitely um, have some good food yeah. because I think this is something that, you know, there is... I mean, I don't want to feed into stereotypes, but maybe there is a stereotype about the UK that um, UK food is not the best food in the world. Um, but I disagree. I think there is a lot of fantastic food, so I would um, have a nice dinner. And then I would certainly go out and enjoy the nightlife. And I think here in London, hopefully tonight, I'm also going to be able to enjoy some of the nightlife. I think you will, from what I hear. Yeah, <laughs> the, the pride festivities are getting underway. <laughs> And it's going to be a really fun weekend in London. Terry, thank you so much for joining us on the Best for Britain sofa. It's been wonderful to talk to you. Uh, we are very, 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 very pleased to have you advocating for Britain, for us inside the EU and looking after our star for us while we are taking what is hopefully not too long a hiatus from our membership. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much for having me. And to our wonderful viewers, thank you very much for watching. We hope you have a fantastic weekend too. And we will see you back on the sofa again soon for the next Best for Britain live. Have a good weekend. Goodbye.